It's a good day. We have been busy for the last several months in the book of Hebrews, and we've done some heavy lifting, a lot of deep theology there. And when Pastor Michael asked me, hey, uh, would you preach this summer? I was like, sure, put me in. He goes, Psalm 14. And I said, sure, a psalm. I mean, flowery language, poetry. How hard could it be? <laughs> Turns out we'll be doing some heavy lifting today as well. And, uh, but uh, I want to make sure that you are ready for it. So turn to Psalm 14. Take the middle of your Bible, you go left or right, it's right there in the middle. Um, But it is my privilege, I'm Hickson Frank, I'm the associate pastor here, and uh, I always love it when when Michael calls me up, and uh, it's pretty nice uh, to see you. If, by the way, you consider yourself uh, a guest, we would sure love for you to take your phone and simply go to nine, uh, text the word connect to 903-525-1100, just follow the prompts, help us get to know you as you are getting to know us. You can do that if you're in the room here or if you're watching online. We'd love for you to do either one. Um, we sure hope, by the way, if you are watching online, at some point you'll come uh, right here so we can hug your neck and welcome you to the Green Acres family. Speaking of, the last, the last few years, um, we know this. We have a ton of uh, new members uh, here. People are new to their faith. They're new uh, to the Bible. And so Instead of just jumping in with, uh, hey, Psalm, like everybody knows what we're talking about, let me just give you a brief background um, on the book of Psalms, okay? The book of Psalms is a collection of poems and spiritual songs, and all of them were meant to be sung. There's 150 of them. Almost all of them we know for sure were meant to be sung. We don't know what they sounded like, which is the beauty, so you can put your own music to it, I suppose, if you like, if you're from my generation and bent like I am, probably some 70s and 80s classic rock. I'm not saying that's what it was. I'm saying it could have been that, right? God of space and time. But it's all songs. So what you find is, is there's a lot of, uh, it's poetic. In fact, uh, almost everybody in this room, regardless of whether you've been a Christian very long or you're not yet a believer, you probably know uh, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. And, and all of the ensuing really poetic uh, descriptions that happen. And so all of the Psalms are like that. Okay? We believe that 73 of these Psalms are written by King David himself. And so that's, uh, to me, that's kind of cool. He was a poet and he played the harp. I'm sure like many of you play the harp. I don't know. Maybe you do. Psalm 14, just a little bit more background. Psalm 14 is remarkably similar to Psalm 53. And not sure, it just, we needed to double down, I suppose, on the theme of Psalm 14. Um, and then uh, lastly, and I think this is important, Psalm 8 and Psalm 14 are kind of twins. But here's the deal. Well, I'm a twin, so I can say this. We've got the good twin and the bad twin. We've got the good twin, the evil twin. Uh, Psalm 8 that we're not in today is the good twin, Okay. Um, And the good twin, uh, you'll see if you look at Psalm 8, I'm not asking you to, but if you go there, you will find that Psalm 8 extols the virtues and the glory of man and explaining some of the things that are great about man. And there are plenty, and you should read it sometime. Today, Psalm 14 is just the opposite. It talks about the wickedness and the ugliness and the depravity of man, you know? (laughs) Welcome to church, y'all. And... What we have is today, though, we got six, really five verses. There's only seven of them, but we got five that'll take us and make us look at ourselves. They'll make us look at our lives. And then we get to look at the Savior, and we come out of it, and verse seven is, is great. And so we will we'll have to do a deep dive in order to come up for air um, at the end. But I say Psalm 8 and Psalm 14, good twin, bad twin, for this reason. On the one hand, people, we, are capable of amazing justice, aren't we? We're capable of amazing kindness and mercy and sacrifice. We build hospitals to heal. We build homes for the infirmed. We uh, create adoption for the parentless. We defend the weak. We build shelters for the poor. And we protect those who can't protect themselves. We do those things in the image of God, and it's a beautiful thing. On the other hand, we are capable of unfathomable cruelty, brutality, and selfishness. 
Never mind what's happening around the world. Let's look at our own environment. We will cut someone down in order to lift ourselves up. We will lie. We will cheat. We will steal. And we will smile doing it. We will make people who disagree with us out to be less than human, making them easier targets while allowing us to sear our conscience when we treat them poorly. It might be the opposing team. It might be the opposing party. But we do it, and we sleep well at night. Blaise Pascal, a 16th century, actually 1600s, um, he was a philosopher and a theologian. Blaise Pascal says this. I'm not in the habit of quoting guys from uh, that long ago, but I thought it was interesting because he says it so succinctly about man and mankind. He calls men the glory and the garbage of the universe. I was like, well, that's, he actually says it more flowery than that. That's what I took from it. The glory and the garbage of the universe. But folks, at some point, God stepped in. And that's where our hope is. We're in Psalm 14 today. And as we read it, I'm just going to ask you to read it and receive it. Okay, so Psalm 14, if you have that already, if you found it, would you stand if you're willing and able? Let's read it together. Actually, I'll read it. I'll voice it. You follow along, and we will get through it. This is the portrait of a sinner. Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good, says the Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. Verse 3, all have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evil doers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on the Lord. Then they will be filled with dread, for God is with those who are righteous. Verse 6, you sinners Frustrate the plans of the oppressed, but the Lord is his refuge. Here we go. Verse 7. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Pray with me, would you? Let's pray. Father, you're so very good to us. We pray that this morning that you would allow us the grace, the mercy, to examine ourselves. Father, help us push away from looking at others as we read your word. Father, we know we cannot change them. Father, we can only change ourselves, and we can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray, Father, you would be open, that you would open us to that this morning. And we pray those things in Jesus' name, and all the people said, you may be seated. Uh, several years ago, uh, I think it was about 15 years ago, I was standing in front of a group of 200 men on our Wednesday night event, and you, if you've been a part of a men's group with 200 guys in it, I mean, it's, it's electric. It's fun because you sing, you sing songs where there's a bass note, right? You don't, you don't sing the girl, you sing, am I, okay, that's what you do, and it's awesome. And then you, you use words like warrior, mission, you use those kind of words, and I was doing it. I was crushing it, y'all, and, and I'm talking to them, and I use this illustration, I want to share it with you. Okay? And this is an illustration within an illustration. So the part that I shared was in 1962, uh, NASA, the Space Administration, needed to find a watch for its astronauts, a watch that would withstand the rigors of space, right? Whatever those are, right? Pressure, G-force, whatever, okay? And, uh, and so they didn't have a watch, so they asked some very famous watchmakers around the world. And they, some of them you had heard of. You've heard of Rolex. They asked Rolex. They ask uh, Longines, they ask Bulova, they ask a number of others, and then they ask Omega. As the story goes, Omega simply went to the shelf, pulled off an Omega Speedmaster, sent it to NASA, we're done. Okay? It turns out that the Omega Speedmaster is the single watch that passed all of the tests and was chosen to go to the moon. In fact, now it's called the Omega Speedmaster Moon Watch. Okay? And I'm telling this story, and again, as guys go, we, we were talking about the mission. You never know when God's going to pull you off the shelf and, and put you on a mission. And, and it's like, yeah, it's great. And at least in my mind, as I look back, I think they carried me off stage on their shoulders. That's how good I think it was. That's what happened. And, 
And, and I use it, and, and so, okay, that happened. True story. That's not true, but that, that did happen. So uh, a week later, I'm getting ready to speak again. It's that morning, Wednesday morning, and I walk by the church offices, the way our church was arranged. Uh, they had, uh, I think every church is this way, slots for your mail, right? Well, I, I just casually walk by, I'm walking by, and I look in my slot, and I go, hey, there's something in my box. And I reach in my box, and in my box is a box. It's about that big, and on the, on the cover, or on the cover, on the top, there's a note stuck in it, and it said this. It said, uh, Hickson, thanks for the talk. I really needed that. I'm feeling good already. And then it says, FYI, I don't want to be one of these. I think, is this some kind? And then it's just a fish sign. I don't even know who gave it to me. To this day, I don't know who gave it to me. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to be one of these. Well, I, I don't, I'm busy. I, I'll open it later. So I get towards the end of the day, I'm getting ready. I've got my stuff, had a few minutes, and I thought I better open that and see what he doesn't want to be like. And I open this box, y'all, inside that box. Are you sitting down? I think you are. Inside that box is a brand new Omega Speedmaster automatic, brand new, is beautiful. I opened it up and I, I, I just, my head about exploded because this is the watch maker. My, my dad wore an Omega. I've always wanted an Omega. And I open it up and it's the Omega Moon Watch. It's automatic. If you're a watch guy, you know what that means. Anyway, so I'm like, I think I have time to go to the mall and get them to take the link out so I can wear it to church tonight. And sure enough, I did. I was late to church, but I didn't care, okay? Because I had my dream watch, an Omega Speedmaster automatic. Now, fast forward a couple months. And by the way, but, but that, that whole time, you guys who have new jewelry or ladies, you got stuff you want to show off. I, I would always talk to people like this. <laughs> you know, right here. And oh, oh you, this? Oh, this? Oh, yeah. Turns out, and I tell them the story. A couple of months later, there is a point to this. A couple of months, a couple of months later, it stops working, y'all. It stops working, and you don't take an Omega just to Joe and Susie jeweler at the mall. You go to the big boys, and so I, I took it in, terrified of what this was going to cost me, and I, I go in, and, and he, I hand him the watch. This is, this is all true. Uh, I feel like I have to keep saying that. <laughs> I don't know why. And uh, I hand him the watch, and he looks at it. He looks at it, and he goes, okay. He goes back, and I bet it's 90 seconds later. He comes back, and he goes, okay, good as new. I'm like, What? And I said, well, what, what did you do to it? Did I mess it up? Was I not doing it? Did I not wind it, right? And he goes, no, it just needed a new battery. To which I said, an Omega Speedmaster automatic doesn't use a battery. I'm, I'm looking at him like, you dope? They don't use a battery. And he goes, well, yeah, but this is a replica. <laughs> yeah, laugh it up. Crush my, crush my soul. And I said, and so literally, I said, and I usually, I mean, I stay fairly composed. I go, it's a fake? Literally, just like that, it's a fake? And he said, yeah, but it's, he could see me. He goes, but it's a good one. Okay, it's a good fake. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It really did turn out another two must go by, the second hand falls off. I'm like, whatever. I don't, so I'm, I'm torn. Do I wear it? Do I not? So here's the point of that ridiculously long story. It looked like the real thing. It acted when there was no pressure, when things were not pressing against it, when it wasn't pulling G-force, when it wasn't in space, when it wasn't on its mission, it looked like the real thing. But as soon as I, oh, I don't know, wore it in the shower, it started falling apart because it wasn't real. What I'm saying is that's the backdrop that I really want you to hear the rest of this message in, okay? Because there is such a tendency in churches, especially great churches like this one, where you have heard the gospel, you have heard the messages, you've had much better preachers than you're hearing today share with you the gospel. And they've shared with you the importance of walking closely to Jesus, with Jesus, and you've heard it all. But at some point, at some point, we still have to examine, do we just look like the real thing or are we the real thing? The way you can tell if you're the real thing is how do you hold up under pressure? Here's what the Bible says, point number one. How's that for a transition? 
in verse 1 through 3. Here's what the Bible says. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. We'll leave it right there. We'll read the rest shortly. David is expressing. David, remember King David, who wrote this, who the Holy Spirit inspired to write this? He is obviously expressing great concern that no one is good, to which I say, what? No one is good? Let me ask you this. When I said, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Did you picture somebody? I'm going to say it again. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. If you pictured somebody, don't raise your hand, certainly if you're sitting right next to them, don't point to them. But if you thought of somebody, just look at me and smile. Got a lot of smiles going on down here. Uh, balcony, I'm assuming you all are smiling. Yeah, okay. Almost all of us go, a fool. Oh, well, I know a fool. I know who a fool is. Being a fool is a very consistent theme in the Bible. It has nothing to do with how smart somebody is. Nothing. You can be incredibly intelligent. It's not saying a fool is not sharp, is not bright. It is a moral statement about the character and nature of the person. This is a person who knows right and wrong, but chooses wrong anyway. Anyone, by the way, can be a fool. It seems harsh. It isn't just the secularists, the materialists, the people that genuinely or generally disregard God. I mean, you just, it's not the people on the other side of the world uh, mocking our faith. It's not the person. Uh, it is simply anyone at all can be a fool. I want to challenge you thinking on something because a fool is said in their heart, there is no God. In their heart, there is no God. Let me read you Titus 1, 15 and 16. It says, to the pure, stay with me, to the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences, conscience are defiled. Listen, verse 16, they claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Who is it that you know of in your sphere of influence that claims to know God? Don't, again, don't answer this. Uh, rhetorical. Well, if we're brutally honest, it's look where we are right now. We're in church or we're watching church online. We are the ones who claim to know God, right? Isn't it us? We are the ones who claim to know God. But for some reason, we have said we know here, but we don't know here. Let's keep unpacking it. We're not talking about atheists here. We're not even talking about practical atheists. Those are people that believe in God, but they live like he doesn't exist. They, they believe in God. Here, here's what we know. This is from Pew Research. I couldn't believe how recently this is. February 2024. Only 4% of the U.S. population are hardcore atheists. They're atheists. Like, nope, no God, no how, no where. The other 96% are people that believe in some kind of God. They believe in some kind. They claim to know God. Okay? Now, let me just let me drive this point home. 4% atheists. Well, we can't blame the atheists for everything. There's only 4% of them. We cannot blame the 4% of the population for the 2.2 million cases of domestic violence in the United States. We can't. A little curveball here. We can't say that they're responsible for the 734,630 reported rapes. We can't say that it's the atheists. We can't say they're responsible for the 690,000 divorces, the 21,356 murders, or the 109,000 children who have been trafficked in the United States. We can't say it's the atheist's fault. What we can say is probably somewhere that 96% of people that claim to know God, that probably attended a church somewhere, they claim to know him here, but their heart was far from him. You agree with that? That's the fool. Craig Rochelle says in his book, The Christian Atheist, our churches are awash with people who embrace all kinds of trappings, of the trappings of belief, church attendance, church jargon, tithing, etc. They believe in God. 
but they do not believe God. He references in Scripture where the Bible says the demons believe and they tremble. The demons believe in God. Sometimes the fool is represented by someone who believes that they have made an arrangement with God. An arrangement meaning, God, listen, we'll, we'll do this thing. I will, I will do a certain amount of things. I will behave a certain way if you just leave me alone in this particular area of my life. Okay? Or, listen, I'm going to make sure my parents are happy. I'm going to make sure my kids are happy. I'm going to do whatever it takes to look like I'm doing what I need to do. But you and I know we got a little arrangement. We know that you kind of wink at that behavior that I know is abhorrent to you. But we got a thing, you and me. It's the God that I've designed myself. It's not the biblical God. It's the God of my own design is what, what the phrase is. Okay. We believe in a God who winks at our sin. We believe in a God that overlooks how we treat one another. We believe in a God that doesn't worry about our dishonesty. We just that's the God we've decided we want to believe in, and that's a fool. That is a fool. The fool doesn't believe in divine justice and lives as though there is no God. Lest we think, by the way, hey, this, this gets better, just hang on. It gets better. The fool has said, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, in Romans 3 says this, there is, and lest you think that it's just purely hyperbole and poetry, Paul himself says there's no one righteous, not even one. He's quoting Psalm 14. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does good. No, not even one. And then it skips. I'll skip a few verses. Verse 18 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, I'm not trying to beat us up. I'm trying to lay it in front of us. Okay. I got to get beaten up for the last two weeks, getting the, two weeks, two weeks, getting this prepared. And I had to come face to face with some things. I was blown away by it. You know what I was blown away? By this. I was reminded in Isaiah. Because here's, let, let me back up because I want you to know. If you came into a room that I was in, in my arrogance, if you said, anybody in here good? I would probably say the right thing, but in the back of my head, I'm going, <laughs> you're looking at him. You're looking at him right here. Hey, listen, guys, I give. I have my quiet time. I'm involved. I'm engaged. We had a baptism earlier. I got to lead that young man to Christ. Look at what I've done. I'm good. And yet, Scripture reminds me of this in Isaiah 64, and maybe he can remind you. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, all of us have become like un something unclean. And listen, our acts, all of our acts of righteousness are like a polluted garment. The best stuff that I do is like a polluted garment, and decorum demands that I don't expound on what a polluted garment is. But that's what my good works are. That's the good stuff that I do. The reason that I say that is, is a reminder to us, because a proper understanding of how I get my righteousness will drive everything from here on out. Let me say that this way. If you believe that your behavior makes you righteous before the Lord. If you believe that you can be good enough, that your behavior is going to somehow get God to love you more, uh, favor you better, if, if you believe that, then you are earning your salvation. You are, uh, have every right to look at someone else who's not doing that and look down on them. You can. Can I get an amen? Don't we want? That was a trick. But if you believe that your righteousness is an absolute free gift from God, that you are not a Christian because you're good, and you are not a Christian because you have done great things or that God needs you to be a Christian. God wants you. He loves you. But His gift is your salvation, is your righteousness. It is given Y'all, we know this, know this to be true. Ephesians, it's very famous. We all know it, but we forget. We are saved. You are saved. I am saved by grace through faith alone. It's not from ourselves. It's a gift of God. 
It is God's gift to us, not from works. And it makes it very clear that nobody can brag. Nobody can boast. You think, okay, I've heard that before, but have we heard it? Because if we have heard it, what that does is it drives humility in our lives rather than arrogance. Your good works and getting God to love you more because you do good stuff, if that is what you do, then of course you should be arrogant. I'll say it again. But if you understand there's nothing good in you that is all by God's grace, then here's how you look at people. Here's exactly how you look at people. You look at that person who you're sideways with. You look at them, oh, they're a child of God. I didn't do anything to deserve this incredible grace. They didn't do anything to deserve. Let's make this okay. Let's make this okay. You look at somebody not with contempt. You look at them with mercy and pity. That's a proper understanding of your gift of grace and righteousness. That's what that drives. And I hope that that makes sense because every split, every harsh word, every anger spoken, it comes when we believe somehow we are better than someone else. Our relationship with Jesus is based on grace. Verse 4 through 6 talk about the oppressed and their refuge. The Bible says this in verse 4, will evildoers, <laughs> easy for you to say, when evildoers, will they ever understand? They consume my people they, like they consume bread. They don't call on the Lord, then they will be filled with dread, for God is with those who are righteous. David seems amazed that the wicked think they can persecute, marginalize, dismiss, attack, and devour God's people with no consequences. Okay? Such are some of us. This verse reminds us, First Peter says this, and I'll read this, and then I want to tell you a story. First Peter 5.10 says, The God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you even after you have suffered a little while. Anybody ever been through a really dark time in your lives? Okay, let me, let, let me start by saying this. I want to tell you about a dark time in my life, okay? Now, anybody ever been through a really dark time in your life? Just raise your hand, okay? Okay, yeah, okay. I, th I think a lot of us have been through a dark time, okay? Uh, a, a while back, a while back, um, I was going through a very dark time. And they're no fun to go through. Feelings of abandonment, feelings of being cut off, feelings of loneliness. This is all, all church-related, right? So uh, this would be three or four years ago. Okay, I wasn't here, to be clear. And I couldn't shake it. And I was sad, and I was mad, and I was frustrated. And then I was out in our foyer at the time, the church I served. I was out in the foyer, whatever it's called, foyer. And you know what we do on Sunday mornings? We shake hands and we kiss babies, so to speak. And we, we're, we're kind. We're, we're helping people do what they need to do. And inside I was dying. But I was doing what we do. Then there was a man in our church who I saw coming at me out of the corner of my eye. It's a man I deeply loved, deeply respected, still do. And he came up to me, and he got, I mean, you know, guys, um, we, got, we got space bubbles, right? It's like, uh, it's too close. Well, he came right up into my space bubble, pushed through it, and got really close. And you know what he said to me? He said three words. He said, I see you. Then he winked at me and left. I see you. And in that moment, I realized there was one other person who had an understanding of what, now it sounds selfish, but what I was going through. Poor pitiful me. And in that moment, I realized that, and he was privy to a lot of things, but I realized that he knew my hardship. He knew the pain. He knew the difficulty that I was going through. And he said, I see you. A refuge is often not a protection from danger. It can be something we offer one another. 
It can be that we get alongside. And I don't even know that this man would remember doing that. I bet he would. But it changed my perspective. It changed my outlook. It strengthened me. It was a refuge. And I realized, well, if this man will know he can see me, how much more does my God, my Father in heaven, see me? A refuge is a spiritual place of peace. A refuge is a place of no longer demanding of God. A refuge is a place that is peace in the midst of the first holiday alone after a spouse dies. It's comfort for the family who struggles with infertility. It's hope for the parents of the prodigal. It's the peace that passes understanding. It's the smile when circumstances demand stress. It's calm when you're facing a terminal diagnosis. It's hope for a family that's ruined by betrayal. It's the inner conviction that God is who He says He is. That's refuge. That is a place where God is. And that is a place that He offers us. Those of you that have been through very dark times, you know that most often or more often than not, God does not change your circumstances. He changes you in your circumstances. The refuge. God is our refuge. He sees us. He knows us. He counts the hairs on our head or the potential hairs on some of y'all's heads, right? He is the person, uh, refuge is the person who grieves in hope. It's the person who suffers greatly and clings to the peace that God promised. That's refuge. And God promises us refuge. If you're here today and you need God to be your refuge, let me promise you that He is. And He is waiting to be that for you. Corey Ten Boom, the Holocaust survivor, one of my favorite authors, says this. I think this is clever. It's easy to remember also. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. Some of us need to look right at God and allow Him to be our refuge. My sweet wife, she's 5'7", and I, I, in the earlier service, I, was, I nearly said what she weighs. I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> but my five, yeah, that would, can you imagine? Yeah, that'd be my, your former associate pastor. Um, <laughs> but my, she, she's 5'7"-ish, uh, right? 5'7", um, a wispy uh, person. And, and several years ago, my son had taken up lacrosse. You know what lacrosse is? Lacrosse is like hockey, soccer, whatever, played with sticks, uh, net, throwing a ball around. It's lacrosse. I grew up playing lacrosse. My wife did not. I knew the rules. My wife did not. In fact, my son who was playing did not know the, the rules to lacrosse. It's okay, though. You know, we cheered him on anyway. And so in, in lacrosse, what you can do, I mean, you, you got a helmet on, you got shoulder pads, you got gloves, you look a hockey goalie. So you can't get hurt. Uh, you know, I, I guess you could, but these kids were not going to get hurt. And during the game, this kid just kept, quote unquote, picking on our son. And my, my wife was like, you better stop that. I watched my 5'7", nothing, wife become 6'3", 280, and just was, and, and said things, uh, you know, with the love of Jesus to the ref. And it's like, you got to do something. You got to do something about my son. And I'm trying to calm her down. I'm like pulling her down. It's like, baby, it's okay. That's part of it. He's not going to get hurt. He's fine. He's fine. It's, it's called checking and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she, I finally got her calmed down. Why do you think my sweet wife, why do you think she was so angry at that kid for doing that to our, uh, Grayson? Because, I'll answer it for you. That was her son. That was her son. You don't mess with my wife's son. Or daughter, by the way. You don't do it. Why? Because it's ours. She's ours. He's ours. Now, let me zoom out a little bit, okay? Everyone in here who claims to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is a child of God. Just this is free. It's not really even part of my notes. We need to be very careful how we treat one another. We're talking to a child of God. That child of God may not know the rules like my son. Didn't know the rules of the game. 
That child may be probably more dangerous to himself than he is to... doesn't matter. God's response, I believe, when we talk to a child of God in a dismissive manner or talk down to or make fun of or gossip slander, I believe that a God in heaven sees that and goes, that's my son you're talking about. That's my daughter you're talking about. Let's just be very careful, okay? Let's be very careful because just as we can, we can help people with, I see you, we can also crush people. And we need to be aware of both of those things. Uh, Verse 7, and here we go, talks about the deliverer. Verse 7 offers hope. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. That's where we start seeing how beautiful the poem is and the music is. And again, I can just, man, the, the final riff on the 70s and 80s rock psalm, I can just see it right here. That's what I see. The verse reminds us that God is at work in this world and he's bringing restoration and redemption. I want to tell you a couple of stories and I'll end with these three stories. I ask our staff, several people on our staff, if they would just give me testimonies of what do you see God doing in your ministries? Okay. And and I said, it's not about your ministries. It's about what God's doing, but let's can you send me some of those? Well, I got overwhelmed. I, I, I picked four. I'll be brief. But here's what I know. In a room this size, in a church that's being blessed like this, not everybody in the church is being blessed. Make sense? So the church as a whole is getting blessed. God's bringing people. We're seeing some amazing things happen. But there's also plenty of room for people that feel alone and isolated and outcast and like God's never going to move in my life. Let me encourage you with these stories. The first one, testimony number one, a quote-unquote cool camp story. I didn't edit these very well, okay? This year at middle school camp, we had an eighth grader who was lost and far from the truth. He got into some trouble for not listening and ultimately telling us he just didn't care to be there. His parents made him come. The camp is not, and the camp is not his thing. He told me and others that he didn't believe in God and never wanted to give it a try. So I talked and prayed for him. And something was calling me not to send that kid home. Just keep giving him chance after chance. There was a day when he was picked on a little bit more than normal. And he packed up ready to leave. And I said, listen, I'm here for you. And I know that you feel very unwanted, but you're not. So we drove around camp in a golf cart. I shared my story with him. He was surprised about my life and it brought up a great conversation. Listen, the last night of camp, he taps me on the shoulder during one of the songs and he said, thank you for caring for me. No one has ever done that for me before. I asked if I could speak to him outside. And the young man prayed to receive Jesus in the most genuine and greatest moment I've ever witnessed. That's a staff person telling us this. They've seen a lot. This this changed his view of not only camp, but God. And he asked his parents if I could mentor him. His parents, listen to this, who have been praying for months for him to find joy and hope and peace, were waiting for this day, and everyone in camp, eyes were opened. Testimony two, Dawn Maxson, we got permission to say her name. Dawn Maxson, this year in Bible study has changed my life. I've learned so much and grown in my relationship with the Lord, even though I've been in church for years. I've never really attended a women's Bible study. I'm so thankful for this opportunity and love all that we do here. Thank you for teaching God's Word so clearly. Testimony number three, Hickson. As I told you, my wife and I are taking, we're talking seriously about divorce. Twice we planned on telling the kids, but just didn't for whatever reason. We could not seem to get along. Uh, Both of us were really wounded. You said that we were stuck, and you were right. When I told you that neither one of us wanted to come to your compass, Bible study. It's called Navigate, by the way. (laughs) I was being serious, but we did it anyway. 
something happened to us over the course of just two weeks. We got unstuck. We have a ways to go, but I'm sure God is moving in our marriage. We started to go to a connect group more regularly and have no more plans to divorce or even separate. Testimony four, and I'll end with this. From our kids' ministry, I recently met a little girl named Nancy Kate Lambian. Got permission. She's nine years old. I met with Nancy Kate and her parents in November. We talked about her faith in accepting Jesus as her Savior in my office. We had a great conversation, and I asked Nancy Kate if she had any questions. She responded with, can my dad baptize me? Her dad was sitting there and said, KJ is his name, well, I first need to give my life to Jesus and be baptized. KJ gave his life to Jesus in January. I was able to baptize KJ, and right after KJ was able to baptize his daughter. That's great, yeah, that's great. Church family, I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. You may have been to church forever. This may be your first Sunday here. But the gift of salvation cannot be earned. And if your gift of salvation drives anything other than humility and love for other people, you're doing it wrong. And this morning, some of you, perhaps, may need to do everything from recommit your lives to Christ. You may need to join the church. You may need to commit to going to a connect group. You may need to remember what it is like to be lost and without hope and praise the Lord that you're no longer lost. The staff and I would love nothing more than to meet with you, to pray with you, to help you through any decision you want. As soon as we're done, we'll go right in the back here to the connection suite. But don't let this be just another summer Sunday. What if God wants your story to be one of these stories? Pray with me. Father, you are so very good to us. You move in ways we can't explain. You offer this free gift of salvation that drives the things that we do, this work that we do, this love for other people, because we know, Father, that we are undeserving, but you chose us. I pray for the men and women in this room, you'd give them courage to do business with you now. Father, that our lives might honor you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray you would use whatever was said here today. Father, we pray that you would use it if it is of you. The things that are not of you, let us quickly forget. Thank you for piercing our hearts with the truth of the gospel. We love you and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen.